So let's begin with what we've been doing on campus. Um, so I was fortunate to be the only faculty member, I think, in the entire college that had uh, summer students, uh, neither of whom are here today because they are off campus, as uh, uh, Dan uh, Pankratz and Josh uh, Heinrichson. And what we've been doing is a spectroscopic monitoring uh, campaign for what are called RV Tori variables. So I should also note that uh, Abby has done some work on this project, and we're going to get up and going with uh, new observations this, this fall fairly soon. And the upshot is I am looking to assemble a team to you know, conduct this observing campaign um, which is a kind of a long-term project because we're looking at these uh, variable stars that have very long periods. So what's an RV Tori variable? This is a post um, asymptotic giant branch pre-planetary nebula variable stars. These are pulsating variables. They're unstable. They're expanding and contracting in radius and their luminosity is varying uh, concurrently. And <clears throat> So these are the last dying shriek before a low mass star ejects its outer layers and becomes a white dwarf, and the ejected layers are a planetary nebula. So we are literally, we are literally watching objects that are pulsating themselves apart as they die. Um, so these are, so F through a G, this is sort of um, around, uh, a little bit warmer than the sun, um, and at minimum light K through M, these are significantly cooler than the sun. These are sort of yellow supergiants. Um, what's interesting about them is that they have this double peak pattern in their light curves, which looks like this. And so they have alternating primary and secondary minima, which I often just describe as looking at like a camel's hump. So what's going on here? Well, you could have resonances between the fundamental and first harmonic. You could have um, chaotic interactions between multiple atmospheric layers and motions. You probably have some shocks propagating through the atmospheres. Um, there are all kinds of complicated uh, things that are going on. The interesting, uh, the reason that this is interesting research is because we have been studying these objects intensely for decades. And the physics that is going on in their atmospheres is still not particularly well understood. Uh, our very own professor emeritus, Dr. Baird, actually wrote his doctoral dissertation on this star right here. Um, that research has progressed since then, uh, but there is still a lot of work to do. And we are actually in a unique place to do that because what we need is night after night after night of spectra and uh, photometry. Photometry is just measuring the brightness of the star through different filters in order to see how the spectra of these stars changes from night to night in order to detect things like motion of different atmospheric layers um, or uh, emission from gas that has been excited by shocks. So we, we need that kind of data Large professional observatories are not really suited to taking to doing this kind of observing, where you're just pointing a telescope at the same star night after night after night. But small observatories are perfect for this. And just recently, in the past decade, research quality spectrographs for small telescopes have become available, meaning that we are in a unique position to now make progress on what is, in fact, a longstanding problem. Um, just to, I've basically given this background already. Um, so just to kind of give you a, a taste of, I guess I should have made these uh, diagrams bigger. So these are actual, are some of our actual results to date. And the things to take away from, from this, so this is um, hydrogen alpha equivalent width uh, versus the light curve. And I know you really can't make these out and I apologize. Um, this light curve, this is photometry, is from the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And here is AC Hercules doing the thing it has usually done for the past few decades, which is to have uh, H alpha in emission. Um, 
corresponding to the rise to uh, its first maximum. Something strange happened between last fall and this summer because now, uh, now we're seeing um, H alpha in, in uh, AC Hercules mostly in absorption and doing and still having a variation that's similar to this, uh, but uh, I could not find any no, arbitrary variables do all kinds of weird things, but I could not find any previous episode where AC Hercules has gone into a mode where it's showing more of an absorption profile than an emission profile. Um, so that's interesting. What does that? What does that look like again with plots that are much too small? But basically, um, you, through last year and for the past few decades, it has shown a spectra that has two peaks on either side of H alpha's central wavelength. And so those, these are all our 2019 spectra. And then here's what it looked like this summer with a big, deep absorption trough and an emission peak as well. This is what's called a P-Signy profile and might indicate that what we have is outflows in the atmosphere. Um, other interesting things that are going on that aren't, as, that aren't immediately obvious is that we occasionally see some other spectral lines in emission. And there are two other stars that we're studying that are of a related class that show very strong emission lines and this is, uh, indicates the presence of shocks in the atmosphere. Um, so where we are with this research, basically, after spending a summer on it, is that you know, we have more questions than answers, which is the, which is the way that science usually works. Uh, so we need lots more data, probably years worth of data. This is a long-term project. Uh, Benedictine College astronomy majors are going to be taking spectra of these stars for probably the next decade or so. Because um, we need long data sets to characterize objects whose pulsational periods are over a month. So that's thing one, and I'll just very, very briefly talk about, you know, the stuff that I wrote my dissertation on, which is this uh, cluster abundance research. I'm going to give a very, very short version of this, because what I really want people to get involved with at this point is the, is the spectroscopic monitoring project. So, and let, let me tell you what I'm, I'm looking for. We need to be able to get data every clear night, which means I need a team of, say, ideally up to seven students where each student has one night of the week that is there to go and get data if it's clear in order to have the coverage without wearing people out. However, if you don't want a night job and you want to actually do your research during the day, I've got a bunch of data, data left over from my grad school and postdoc days. And the basic idea there is, oh, I should use this one, is um, we want to understand how the amount of oxygen has changed in the galaxy over the last 10 billion years or so. Um, <clears throat> because the notion is that oxygen is probably a better tracer for galactic chemical evolution than iron, which has been kind of the, the textbook tracer for decades. Um, so uh, back in 1993, a colleague of, or kind of grandfather's project, Jeremy King, finds this what apparently linear relationship in a sample of open clusters. There would be dragons in apparently linear relationship. Don't trust them. Um, so we're looking at open clusters, which are collections of maybe a few hundred to a few thousand stars in the disk of the galaxy. The great thing is they all form together from the same gas. Therefore, we can constrain their composition and their age very precisely, allowing us to trace the amount of, say, oxygen in the galaxy over time. Um, big labor dates are what? OK, interesting. I don't know what that is. Um, some anomalous thing. What we're doing is an equivalent width analysis. Basically, we measure the width or the strength of the absorption lines in the spectrum, and we run it through a, an analysis code that takes that and a model for the atmosphere of the star, and you turn the magic crank and out pop some numbers. Um, 
very briefly, what we have found thus far is that it's a lot more complicated than that apparently linear relationship. It looks like what we're actually seeing is that oxygen in the galaxy was kind of um, being washed out by infall until maybe about two billion years ago and then suddenly jumped up. Um, this is very interesting because the models that, um, that look at things like fresh gas falling onto the galaxy, um, they do not predict anything like this sudden jump, which could indicate that the infall of new gas stopped for some reason um, onto the galaxy about two billion years ago. Uh, so this is not the result that we went looking for, uh, but, if, but we found something, again, as tends to be the case with science, um, much more provocative than, the, than what we thought we were going to find. So um, I have some data left. This is not to say that this research is winding down, but I have less data sets now that are accessible to students. But if somebody is interested on, in a more of a day job type research, um, I have this available as well. So, and I shall, I shall leave it there. Let's see, so I think, I think now for the sake of time, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and hand it over to the, to the SPS folks. All right, here, this one shouldn't be too long. This is just quick stuff from last year because as you all know, COVID hit. And so usually where we do SPS elections at the end of the previous year, so we would have done in the spring, that obviously did not happen this year because everybody was stuck at home and having a rough time to start with. Um, so because of that, we decided to postpone elections. And now because of COVID, it's still going on. We decided to essentially just, we're going to just keep the offices the same for this year so we haven't been able to recruit the usual amount of people. Um, and so. Cassie is going to remain president. I would be secretary. Joseph Pencher is vice president. Kent, though, has sadly left, so we do need a new put, um, position for this. Um, how elections work is you have to elect someone else, and then it goes to a vote, and then whoever wins the majority wins. So since Kent is not here, I would like to ne not neglect. That is not Nominate. Word. Elect <laughs> Isabel Kopp. Is there any show of hands for that to be good? Any other options? All right, Isabel is now our treasurer. We'll figure out what that means eventually. Um, on other side note, for SPS Club, we would always like new members. We're always looking to recruit. Um, last year, we got like 40 people to sign up for it. A lot of them didn't come, but we still got the numbers, and that's what matters. No, it's not. But we got, we got a more regular showing up last year. It has died off because of the spring thing. We are doing club fair again. Um, it's Thursday, 5.30 to 7.30, if I remember correctly. If you want to volunteer at that, feel free to come down. We can do some experiments, sh shove them in people's faces and tell them to join. It'll be great. Um, other than that, we'll try and keep you posted on SPS stuff that's going on. But that was really all we had to do. Team, go SPS. Well, thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you for everyone who uh, joined the live stream. Uh, thank you to our amazing videographer, Marie Ryu. Uh, 